My room's a mess, everything's a mess, and I don't, it doesn't matter, and you get involved in daydreaming and uh, writing down. Y making stuff up <laughs> is really fun. <laughs> it's really, really fun. And a sentence that just has that curve and all those things are very beautiful. And the times you can make yourself laugh, maybe, you know. Typos some days are the only entertaining thing. It's redemptive in the sense that you're redeeming your memories and the things that you get that you lose in your life. A gesture that someone made that for some reason broke your heart. Uh, things that you can't get out of your head. Uh, uh, the way a, a dog looked when he came in from a walk, you know? Uh, smells and sights and colors that would be lost otherwise. So you feel like you're gathering your life in again. When I was six, uh, coming home from Grosvenor School, uh, learned uh, Dick and Jane, and boom. I, it was right away. I, I wanted to write, but I didn't publish my first novel till I think I was 36. I did a master's uh, at Simon Fraser, and I really needed to do that. I needed to, I studied um, style, mostly. And uh, I needed to keep studying language. I needed to keep studying literature. And then uh, even after my master's, I studied with Robert Croach and uh, Dennis Cooley and David Arneson, the three wise men at the University of Manitoba. I started freelancing, writing about trucks and um, mobile homes and whatever, for a trucking magazine, actually. And then sort of fake journalism for a while, um, whatever would interest me if there was, I'd be curious about a person mostly and do profiles, sell them to, uh, you know, the free press or magazines. I edited a magazine, Eye on Winnipeg. I did radio um, documentaries on abortion and one profile of a, a hurdy-gurdy man uh, with a Ukrainian translator. That was another way of kind of stalling while I was trying to write fiction, just to try and get my chops, you know, get get a feel for dialogue and uh, and and pay, you know, the rent. My early stories <laughs> would be about um, barely about anything, and mostly about uh, about God knows um, small ripening, small. Uh, it's very small events in someone's consciousness. I was very slow to start to get published. I, I mean, I didn't submit very much. Uh, I was too afraid. I had two little kids, uh, and I got a little grant from Manitoba Arts Council, which scared me half to death, and it was great. And um, so it paid. It was I was able to. Uh, uh, by a bit of time. And I was surprised that it was called a novel, like I put it together and got 200 pages and said, here's a novel. <laughs> and uh, I was very lucky and there was Turnstone Press there. I've been the fiction editor at Turnstone for a long time and we see a lot of good books, but uh, we don't see books that make the hair stand on, on the back of my neck that often. I just thought, wow, this is really impressive. Very, very good writer. Her first novel, uh, Fox, is set uh, in around the time of the 1919 general strike in Winnipeg. Like a forest in autumn, the colors of wood and sunburnt leaves, windy, the pell-mell voices of the crowd gabble and crow, men mostly, every seat in the place full, men in the aisles and men in the lobby, with all the clamor of an or orchestra tuning. They fill the big room, voices hum and rumble from the front of the stage to the balcony, and above the restless and baroque ceiling of the Walker Theater. Russell and Ivans and the others are already on stage, hands in their pocket, talking fast and earnest and smiles everywhere. Blumenberg telling something funny to Bobby Russell, 
and Russell even cracks a smile, lays his hand on Sam's elbow. John Queen, the old alderman, calls the meeting to order and everybody settles down. Up front, a short, chubby fellow with a face like a bowl of porridge takes out a notebook, licks his pen. It could have gone sour right then, but nobody takes it seriously, just good-natured, and one guy gets a good laugh when he says in a loud voice he'll correct the spy's spelling when he's done. There's a whole lot of polish and elegance in that book, and there's definitely a lot of polish and elegance in Margaret. I was really in love with the uh, uh, millennial social gospel language where there was a feeling that at this very moment we are creating a new world. But there's always the importance of that historical context and also the political one. I think that's very prevalent in all of her work. She's doing a lot of uh, very clever things uh, simultaneously in the way that say, and this is just off the top of my head, Robert Altman is in his films cutting and moving back and forth and and pushing on the edge of this character and seeing what can be done with that idea. And so you, you get something that is highly artistic. Lighting a cigarette, pudgy hands that would hold a martini soon. He was balding, getting fat. Sharon said he looked like an 87 Chevy, but he loved women with a genuine gossipy affection. When you have a conversation with her, half the time you have no idea where that comment came from, but it's exactly right, and it's like, it throws all the windows open. It's like, oh, now I know where I am, in a completely different way. She has a very quick mind, and, and she leaps, uh, she makes leaps, which is, I think, uh, actually often than a mark of a, of a poet. Still, now, when her eyes are dark, she isn't blind, but she can't see the bluest bells waving in the south onshore wind. Her eyes always will be blue. He loves her eyes. He always loves her eyes. The tide goes out as it will. It takes a lifetime to gain what she is losing, her beauty, that thing she does with her hips. In a terry cloth bathrobe, brushing her gray hair while she grips the sink. If you can learn to read poetry, you can learn a lot about compression, about dramatic beats, um, about uh, inner voicings, about uh, the sound of language, uh, about clarity, actually. People think poetry is obscure, but really what they're working towards is utter clarity. Her writing is deeply layered, I would say highly layered, multi-dimensional, really very challenging writing. It's not for everybody. When I wrote uh, the second novel, Sam and Angie, and at that point I was really interested in plot. I was trying to, f because I was afraid of it, that's what I was trying to do. And uh, there was still a lot of criticism that it was uh, overly literary uh, and poetic. Um, I, I, I guess for me, I. I when I'm reading a book, I demand a certain, uh, I require a certain uh, pressure on the surface of the language. They drank white wine, but they never had a hangover, though sometimes their eyes when they woke were fervid and over clear. Angela and Sam would wake very early, everything about them sweet with citrus, a clean burn, a pure fermentation. So you really have to think about that. What is that about? What does that mean? Uh, is it simply they're drinking a little bit too much wine? Uh, or is there something else going on? And as you find out, there is something else going on. There is, there is a kind of a burning going on, I guess, beneath the surface in this, what looks like a very modern marriage uh, what looks like a very almost trendy, upper class, cool people driving their cool cars and having their cool businesses. And uh, so on the surface, um, in fact that's a good word, 
cool. On the surface, everything is cool, but underneath it's burning and uh, it's in turmoil and it's terrible. One of the things is you get so involved in the characters that sometimes the crises are your crises, you know. Uh, that's not a bad thing with literature. <laughs> Every book is different, new, and always trying to go into another place. When Alice Lay Down with Peter is another one of those very heavily historical books. Uh, and also very playful. And it's the story of Manitoba and, and the Red River Valley and the Red River, which is just a block over there. The storyteller is 109 and she dies, like in the, at the beginning. Like, so to tell us a big, long, sort of epic story after that, there's a kind of, uh, there's a kind of joy in the absurd. Since Eli passed on, I have relished my solitude. So it was that I put on yesterday's skirt and blouse and in the innocence of routine, I went to the garden with my hoe. Softened and kneaded by the loving hands of morning, I did up only the three pearl buttons between my collarbone and my wishbone. I was play acting, pretending I was young. To my delight, I felt a flush of sexual desire, tender as rain. I am not a big chested woman, especially now, of course, my arms sag and my armpits have jowls. The buttons tore off when I fell, and so it is, you see an old woman's breasts, which are like very overripe peaches. I have always had lovely breasts, small as they are, and that devil's kiss, my birthmark, brown as an acorn at the cusp of rib and breast. It is certainly provocative in its own way, and if you stretch the word a million miles, sexy, Though I am old, I am 109 years of age, since the 12th of this month, born on a hot day in 1870. I would have to admit I am ancient, and today, which happens to be a Tuesday, I am dead as a stick. Your reader doesn't know that they're going there, and when you get them there and they go, ah, and, they, you know, and then you've done something, so. That's what is, that's what I'm after now, yeah. And with uh, the players, she went even further back in time to the uh, late 17th century. I think it was like 1660 that the novel's set in. It goes to the sort of the end of that period and the reign of King Charles II and uh, Prince Rupert. That was 10 years writing that book and I, I left it for a year here and a year there. Uh, but overall, it was 10 years of being obsessed by rewriting that book. Um, over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And so it's the time of uh, Shakespeare and uh, the Black Plague and, um, and all kinds of things like that in, in London. Uh, and Lily gets herself involved with a playwright who's writing scenes particularly for her. The first drafts were in 17th century language, which was pretty incomprehensible to most people. Uh, so I had to once I got, I had to get over the language and find the story. I had to digest the language and stop being so crazy about it. Addison and Grossi, they were, you, you felt like you, you knew them. The king's broke and he wants to get uh, hooked up with the actress and uh, yeah. have a fling and then she runs out of town and hops on a boat to get away from it all and ends up in James Bay. It's extremely playful. It's from the point of view of the native looking at these white people and this white woman. And I just love the whole section. Then Lily emerged from the bush and hurried toward the house, her hands filled with white rabbits. Bartholomew and Sparrow followed her. The sight calmed the chief, the Cree chief. Women always calmed him. Did you bring your women? He asked Radisson. No, said Radisson. If that is not a woman, you are not a man. She is one who belongs to the king. The English king keeps slaves? Radisson hesitated. She is young, but inside she is tough like the old N. She is not weak and contemptible like a woman is weak and contemptible. So in this way, she is not a woman. Can she cook? Oh, she is a terrible cook. Lace the snowshoe? I'm very bad at that. The chief drew back. He knew of many slaves and he didn't like it. 
Nations to the south take slaves. Here, he thought, where we must account for every breath we take, a slave is excessive, wasteful, and will bring bad luck. But nowhere had the chief seen a slave who was useless. He wanted to meet her. She really is extremely hard on herself and hard working. So nothing's quite good enough. She's always pushing at her own boundaries and she'll never take the easy road. So each, each novel becomes more complex and more difficult and more remarkable. You know, some people are drawn to adventure and um, heroism and I think for me it's sex and politics. <laughs> She likes to have fun. She's pretty easygoing, although she can get opinionated on certain topics. An artist has to be true to themselves, and I actually do think that's probably Mar Margaret's greatest talent. She's got a natural gift for words and natural musical ear, but being herself, I think, is something she's always been pretty good at. That's the most important thing. You have to like it yourself, and I'm, I am proud of my books, yeah. So a good writing day really is it's a, mostly a morning of reading and then try and then sitting and staring and freaking out and walking around and and go for a walk and, and maybe um, weep a little bit and and then it, you, you hit the pocket putting aside real life and um, all your uh, kind of moral obligations to your family mostly and um, and making a living and everything, and um, and just uh, thinking freely. It's just, and everything is possible at this point. It's quite rude and it's quite anarchistic and it's often quite um, angry and um, it, with any luck there's a certain degree of violence and all the things that you don't have uh, when you're um, accommodating your loved ones. All of the things, it's opposite and it's a pain in the neck for them. It was totally great. Uh, <laughs> no, no complaints about creative work. I mean, it's the best work. It's so lucky to be able to do it. Now she's, she's teaching. She's a great teacher. She's, um, she's, always, she's always finding well, my experience of her is she's always, she always finds in your work more than you really thought was there. If you're really thinking about writing, you're probably not writing very well, uh, see, and I, I do tell my students that, see, see and hear. And the students are often quoting Margaret Sweatman to me, and they're saying, well, Margaret Sweatman says that when you first start developing a character in your mind, that you can't go up to that character directly and say, who are you? Tell me about yourself. But instead, you have to kind of sidle up slowly and start talking about trivial things and just sort of get to know them slowly. I just love her writing. It's full of imagery and it's full of that magic of music in some way, you know. So whatever it's, whatever's there in the first two lines is music, you know, I can make it into music. She's written songs with her husband, Glenn Buer, but she's also started to sing. You know, like, she just said, she wrote me an email when I was living with me, she's like, I'm starting to sing. I don't really, why, how on earth could I get up in front of people and sing? And I think, well, of course you can, because she just doesn't step back from anything. I don't know why I sing the I never thought I'd sing till I met Glenn. I was uh, 40 when, when we married. They just gravitated into something that they could do together quite naturally. Margaret was in the studio singing for the first time and was very shy about it. Turn my way It was to see if I'd follow Glenn, I believe, dragged her there, kicking and screaming, and, but she did it, and she was uh, quite nervous about it, but as the years went on, she became more comfortable with it, and, and now the two of them are a bit of a writing team. Pick my pocket, steal my heart. I think she's always writing, frankly. I mean, she, she sits at her desk and writes a lot, too, but I think she, she writes wherever she is. I, I think I am interested in uh, 
the differences uh, between men and women. <laughs> no other writer. <laughs> I showed up at their place to drop something off and she and Glenn were in the kitchen and cooking this gorgeous meal together and you could see I'd walked into an event. There's just beauty in, in, in how she tries to live. I have two male friends and uh, they really, really like the players and I, I think about that often while I'm cleaning the bathroom and washing the kitchen floor. I, I, I recall that because I need it. I need, like they truly had a good time, you know? They just had a good time. That's really what I want. <laughs> when we don't talk about the structure, or the language or the politics or they had a good time and that is everything to me. Your lover's eyes are blue as the ocean Her eyes are green as the sea She's a willow leaning to the river She's pining for you and me 